Okay, so our, our final speaker for this afternoon is Suong Wenhua, who has been working on polymer composites since 1979. He's worked on various aspects, including analysis, testing, design, materials development, and manufacturing. And has been working on automated composites manufacturing since 2012. It's collaborated with many companies, such as Bombardier Aerospace, Bell Helicopter, Pratt & Whitney, MDA, DMAT Aerospace, FP Innovations, Bauer Hockey, and so on. He currently holds an industrial chair on automated composites manufacturing supported by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada and Bell Flight Limited. He's a member of the Canadian Academy of Engineering. He's written several books on composites, including a book on the principle and manufacture of composite materials. Please, um, as before, put any questions into the Q&A box rather than into the chat, um, if you would be so kind, so that it's easier for me when we get to the end. Uh, so, okay, so I'll hand over to Suang Banhua at this point. Thank you, Suang. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. Uh, so what I would, uh, first I would like to thank um, Kevin Porter for having invited me to uh, make this presentation today. Uh, to share with you my overview of the uh, advanced composite manufacturing, recent advances, challenges, and opportunities, and also uh, the opportunity to present some of the results of the work that we have been working at Concordia on the automated composite manufacturing. So the um, my outline to the presentation consists of five different items. First, I will talk about the focus of the presentation. Next, I will talk about the use of thermoset metric composite in automotive composite, composite manufacturing and then thermoplastic composite and then future outlook and conclusion. So first is the focus of the presentation. For To define the focus, what I need to do is to define what it means by automotive composite manufacturing. In my opinion, any manufacturing process that utilize machines with some degree of automation can be qualified as the composite or automatic, automatic composite manufacturing. The reason why I need to do this because when I was organizing the previous uh, symposia on automatic composite manufacturing, I need to make a decision to see which, after which abstract should be accepted or not, because there are people that claim that they are doing automatic composite manufacturing that may not be. So with this definition here, there I think that the field is very large. And for that here that I want to really main, uh, qualify in terms of some of the aspects that um, I will not cover in this presentation. So the first item here, filament winding. I think filament winding definitely is an automotive composite manufacturing process. It is an additive manufacturing process as well. And actually some of the AFP ATL were based on filament winding. There has been a lot of literature and information on this technology. So I said, I will not discuss this technology in detail in my presentation today. Another process that is also qualified is automotive composite manufacturing that is protrusion. And protrusion can be used to really kind of manufacture many components with uniform cross-section effectively economically. And again, this technology has been around for many years. There's a lot of information about it. Again, I will not include this in my presentation in detail today. Another process that also can be qualified as automotive composite manufacturing is thermal stamping. So thermal stamping is similar to compression molding, except that it's more, the, the uh, temperature of the panel may not be that high. And as such here, then people use this technique to be able to make small components with complex geometries out of thermoplastic composite fairly well. But again, due to the lack of time, I will not discuss this topic in detail today. Another topic that is also of importance and qualified is automotive composite manufacturing. That is the case of the material handling, pick and place. Now, I think the presentation of Sue Patrick earlier today, as she mentioned quite a bit of this technique, in the sense that this one here is uh, some kind of robot with the actuators. And the actuators, at the end here, you have some kind of suction cup. And they use the suction cup here with the actuator to be able to place against some kind of pre wrap or some kind of material, and then you can pick it up. And you can pick up these things here to transfer from one table to another one, such as the case from a layup table to some kind of a mold surface, for example. 
So this kind of thing will be useful to transfer pre bracket dry fibers, auxiliary materials, backing material, etc. So this is a very powerful technique in terms of trying to, to transfer the materials. And again, I don't have time to go over it in detail, but recently there is a review paper in 2018 that addressed this technology. So in case of for people that are interested, I think you can take a look at the review paper. So what is it that I will this, uh, focus on? I will focus on two technology that is a case of ATL, automated tape layup, and automated tape uh, placement or automated fiber placement or AFP. Now the reason why I want to focus on this is because these are new technologies and they have been used quite a lot in the aerospace industry to make many components for the airplanes. So along this line here, then I will talk for this technology, there will be two aspects of two kinds of material that these uh, two processes handle. One is thermoset matrix composite. Now for the case of thermoset matrix composite, we have not done a lot of work at Concordia. So I may obtain information mainly from the literature in terms of this particular aspect. And also in the case of thermoplastic composite where we have done a some amount of work. So I will talk more about the, our work on thermoplastic composite using AFB later on. So um, the idea for the factory of the aircraft in the future, I show you two pictures, one on the left that show the case of the conventional way of making uh, aircraft component using composite. So mainly it's by hand layup with a lot of people around. And the other picture on the right hand side, that is the case of the picture of the automotive application where there's a lot of robots. So there are certainly, we may think that, okay, in the future, probably the manufacturer of aircraft may look something like the case of the automobile. So maybe we don't know yet, but the present time in terms of the way how the AFB and ATR are used and they're mainly used for making large simple structures. The objective of the automation for the uh, of, of composite manufacturing is how to deposit materials at high speed with good accuracy and few defects. So three main items, high speed, I mean, you need to get to be able to deposit material with a large amount of material within a certain time, precise, precise precision and also few defects. So you can take a look here in the case of, you have the uh, this gantry uh, is depositing these kind of laminate onto uh, this kind of a mold. And you can see this laminate is huge. This, you can compare again the size of a person and see how huge that is. Now, the reason for that is because of the fact that in order to be able to deposit material at a high speed and so on, that you can mainly work on large parts and also limited geometry, limited uh, geometry complexity. So for this, I find that in order to be able to do this, and I find the thermoset composite, they are more suitable for this kind of process than thermoplastic composite. And I think there were a few questions in the previous presentation about thermoplastic composite that I feel the thermoset composite is more suitable. And I would mention about the reason for that a bit later, later on. So now we look into the case of use of um, automation for thermoset matrix composite. Now for the case of thermo thermoset matrix composite, the main concern when we lay down the layers is for them to stick together. When you lay down a lot of pre-breaks for them to stick together. So for this here, the temperature that we need is not too high. So maybe between 40 degrees to 60 degrees centigrade. And the objective is mainly trying to make sure that is the tacky, that means stick together so that you, they, they can uh, make one single piece. So along this line here, uh, I think that the thermoset metric composite have established a foothold to be accepted in the aerospace industry. And many major companies such as Boeing and Airbus have used automation as a way how to make many large structures. I'm sure everybody has seen these pictures in terms of making the uh, fuselage either for the Boeing 787 or three, uh, Airbus 350. So what are the issues right now in terms of the, uh, the improvement of uh, the use of automation for thermoset metric composite? So we're gonna find here there are few aspects. These are the speed of deposition, efficiency of machine use, inspection, fiber steering, and dry fibers. So the speed of deposition and the effective machine use. I first, I want to show you just a lap time machine. This is a, the lap time machine we have at Concordia. So I'll show you quickly just the kind of motion that, uh, that is taking place. So this basically, that is a lap size machine, but that is a big difference between the case of a production machine. 
Now, I, I mentioned before the production machine in the real aircraft manufacturing is very large. So when we work with the lifetime machine, machine they may, we may not see issues that people in the production uh, area may see. And because in this case here, then the objective is trying to deposit things very quickly. And there are many items that we will spend the time to study. And basically they do some kind of a time motion, the time analysis of the machine. to see what aspect of the machine takes to the amount of time. So here we have the one aspect loading the dough. I mean, if you have a machine that have 32 heads, you spend some time to load the dough. So that takes some time for that to happen. The next one here is the different modes of material deposition. I mean, during the time that you deposit the material, it depends on whether you have a continuous course of the machine running that can go very high speed, they call it the mid-course payout. Or you have some kind of a location where you have some slowdown, where you have to add or you have to cut the stoves. Or you have a small piece with a gap. And another motion here called the off-back motion. That means where the machine has to go back from the beginning so that you lay down again. So they get off away from the surface of the part. So that's an off-back motion. Another activity of the machine called reliability recovery. So that means during the deposition process, there are many issues that is splicing the toe end. That means you, you, you are at the end of a grill of, uh, of the fiber that you have to connect the two ends together. So that means spend some time to splice them together. Or if the toes are broken or the toes are twisted or the toe may be sticking to the roller, then again, you have to spend some time to repair it. Then another activity that the machine has to spend is inspect and review. I mean, after you deposit the layer, then people have to make sure that it's okay that they have to inspection. Now it depends on the inspection, whether a manual or automatic. If it's manual, it takes a lot of time. I will mention about that later on. And then after you found the defect, you have to decide what to do with the defect, the treatment of the defect. If the defect is not that severe, you may neglect it. If it's critical, you have to repair it, or maybe it's too, too bad, you may have to reject. And another item here called the tool move and wait. So here in the there was a paper in 2019 for the people in electro impact company. And in that one, they make a statement that I find to be kind of provocative. It say AV machines in aerospace manufacturing spend much of their existence doing nothing. So that is a very provo provocative statement. Now these machines are very expensive, 10 a million of dollars. That it would be a crime to say that the machines sit there, sit there doing nothing. So what is the reason why they say that? Now, the reason they say that is because they analyze the different kind of time motion that I mentioned to you in the previous slide. And they find that in the old, the, the previous way, the layup time. Layup time, that means the real production time, the time when the machine lay down the material is only count for 19% of the total time when the machine goes into a production cell. So what happened to the other time? The other time here, the inspect and review. That's 42% of the time. Now inspect and review, that means what they did before is that they have to do that manually. That means they have to get an operator to go and look at every part. So it, it, it comes very fast to deposit, but it takes a long time to inspect. So that is not very good. Then you have also recovery, uh, reliability recovery 14% of the time. To move and wait, 517 and uh, the break operator 8%. So people have improved to the current technology in, by 2019. Is a layup time increase of 42%. Inspect and review go down to 28%, and the other three aspects remain the same. And then hopefully in the future, they want to improve the layup down to 76%, and the other time is remain similarly. So this slide here, again from uh, the Electro Impact in 2017, they give some of the speed of the position of the, the, the head. So this one here, this is the, the head from Electro Impact. And in this case, here it has 20 toes, one and a half inch wide. So each time it can lay down 30 inch wide of the materials. And here they lay down on a large surface with the low contours, with the four heads. So the speed of the maximum speed that can be laid down is 4,000 inch per minute, which is equivalent to six kilometers per hour. And that way correspond to more than 3,000 pounds per hour of material deposited. So that is a fast speed. If you have to do add and cut, it go down to 1,200 inch per minute. And the minimum gap, we have 600, off back motion 6,000. So out of the average, out of all the different time here, the average amount of material deposit is about 900 pounds per hour. So that shows the kind of the speed of material deposition. The next aspect here that is inspection. That means the case that how much time do you have to spend to inspect? So this case here in the past, a lot of AFV, they are, do, they are done by manual inspection. 
and that consume a large amount of time and sometimes you may miss the defect. And the time can be more than 25% of the total time and may escape detection. So over the past few years, there have been quite a bit of activities addressing this issue, including universities and companies to look into this aspect. So in 2016, there was a paper presented from people in Germany and they developed a system called thermographic system. Thermographic system that means in this case here, they get an infrared camera and they observe the first word, the surface of the plate that has been just deposited. And by doing this, then they can detect the total location gap lab and foreign bodies. In 2019, there was a publication from the National Research Council of Canada. They worked together with FIRE's machining system and they developed a system called optical coherent tomography. And this is similar to ultrasound imaging where they use some kind of a light to be able to detect over the surface. And by making a scan over the surface of the laminate here, they are able to see some kind of deviation whenever you have something like a toe ply or a toe wrinkle. And of, from the industrial side, again, from the electro impact people into publication in 2018, they have developed a system where they use a laser. You have the profilometer, they have the projected laser line on the surface of the substrate. And for this here, they were able to detect more than 1000 toe ends in a few minutes. And they identify 92% of the toe end in the, in the instead of ply. So this system here, they were able to detect the presence of the defect effectively within a short time. Now for these kind of inspection system, there, there is a need for software programs. There's a lot of information that is generated. You need to have software program to be able to handle the data. And the data can approach more than one terabyte per part per complex parts. So this one here, the huge amount of data that had to be processed. And however, it can reduce the inspection time, reduce human error. And besides that, they can also have some kind of statistical process control to eliminate unnecessary fixes. I mean, there may be some kind of defect that may not be critical and you may as well for neglect it, or maybe there are something that more severe, you have to work on it. However, this machine here is no, not cheap, costs more than $1 million. And besides that also the manufacturer need to make decisions about what to do with the inspection data. So that means after you have seen the data, then you have to decide what to do with that. If the defect is not severe, you say, okay, I can live with that, I can move on. If the defect is uh, significant, you have to repair it. And if that is too, too critical, you may have to reject the part. So in last year, there was a publication from people in the University of South Carolina, and they identified 14 different kinds of defects. 14 different kind of defects inside the laminate made uh, using AFB. That they lap, overgap, overgap, overlap, buckle, wrinkle, bridging, boundary coverage, angle deviation, fold, twist, wandering toe, loose toe, missing toe, splice, position error, and foreign object. So identify 14 different kinds of defects. And they also classify the defects based upon five perspectives. So what are the five perspectives? The first is anticipation. Anticipation, that means the way that you can predict the defect based upon the generated, the computer generated uh, fiber path. Because in automation, you have a, some kind of computer to generate the fiber path and you know where the fiber is. So depending on the fiber path and the relative geometry of the part, you can predict whether there will be some defect at a certain location or not. The second perspective is existence. Existence, that means that whether your inspection system can detect it. You use some, some system where you can, you can detect the, the defect. The third one is significance. That means that what is the effect of the presence of the defect on the performance of the part, whether that's critical or not. The fourth one is progression, whether the defect will grow during the process. And the, third, the fifth one is deposition, what to do with the defect, whether the defect is critical, not critical, and you have to make a decision on that. So they also made a survey of the work that have been done on the effect of the defect on the performance. So there have been quite a large number of papers published on the effect of the defect of the performance. And from this survey, they found that for the case of quasi-static loading in unnotched unidirectional laminates, that the effect is not significant. The, the effect on the performance is probably less than 10%. However, the, the effect is more severe in fatigue loading, where the effect of the defect can be up to about 40, 30%. They also mentioned that in the, due to the fact that you have a large number of defects, 
And also we need the, the fact you have different geometry configuration, large number of layers. So the work that has been done up to now is only looking into some very limited configurations and a lot more work needs to be done before we can really understand the effect of the defects uh, to have a, a grasp of what happens. So the next aspect here concerning the AFB is the fiber steering. So certainly one of the nice feature about using the automotive replacement is that they can steer the fiber. You can see that you have this here and also there was work done at Bristol sometime ago about the toe, toe shearing, which is a similar aspect to be able to max the, um, the fiber that is curvy linear. However, there is a minimum, there is a minimum limit a radius that you can steer because if you can steer lower than the minimum radius then you have defect, such as the case of you have the uh, buckling, wrinkle, buckering and so on. And so in order to be able to really kind of improve this that you need to have a precise and focus the heat and the good compaction pressure to be able to control this aspect. And people found that the laser heating is a better way of heating uh, than the case of, uh, or, or the, because it has more focus and good control. So there are many factors affecting the, uh, the steering radius. These are the toe width, toe thickness, resin type, resin tackiness, fiber type, fiber format, subtract contour complexity, subtract quality, arc length and tolerance parameters. Now from the so publication from a few company electro impact corrosion and in Ingolson machines, they found these are the minimum radius that you can tow, that you can steer. Say for one quarter of an inch tow, radius is 19 and a half inch, quarter inch tow between 11 inch to 59 inch, half an inch tow, six inch. However, there was a statement from uh, the publication from this company that I find interesting. It says here, such steering sees limited use given the fact that composite aero structures operate in a certification environment that favor traditional and quasi isotropic life life schedules. So what this says is that at the present time, they may be the industry are not using it yet. However, I think that the work done, mainly academic, but I think will be useful in, in maybe the future and also from other applications. Now, the last thing that we talked about the case of the uh, thermosetmetric composite is dry fibers. Now, the reason why I put the dry fiber within the metric composite is because when we do the automation to make the dry fiber, we make only the preform. And after you have the preform, you need to infuse resin into the preform to make the composite. And normally people use thermosetmetrics as a way to, as a resin to infuse into the dry fibers. The case of dry fibers, normally they had to use some kind of a thermoplastic binder. And uh, during the process, the thermoplastic binder need to be melted so that you can free the fiber. As such, you need to have a good amount of heat. The temperature is between 160 to 200 degrees centigrade to be able to process it. So the advantages and at least advantages of the dry fiber. So the dry fiber, because of the fact you don't have resin, so that means the downtime event and repair times are less for the uh, AFE processing. They say that people feel that they can increase from 15 to 30% increase in machine utilization. And also the fiber have better uh, tension control and such a speed can be larger. And people usually use laser focus, uh, the heating on the active dose. However, that is this advantage. So I mean the development of furs. Furs, I mean you have the furzing of the fibers because of the dry fibers. In this case, they can result in some kind of foreign object recreation on the laminate. It also requires a higher temperature heating and fiber tension control. And because of the fact that you use higher temperature heating, you have to use a strong laser. And you use a strong laser, then you have to be provide safety measure because it can be dangerous in case that it hits somebody. And also the laminate have a lower tucking and this makes the part more fragile and produce uh, challenges on a thicker layer. So there was a publication in, uh, uh, in 2019, they were making two kinds of laminates. One is by manual, I mean by hand layup, and then they infuse resin into it. Another way use a dry fiber and that they also infuse resin. And they were comparing the laminate made with two different kinds of method, manual and hand layup, and ADF, ADFBM uh, is the automated dry fiber placement. So when they make the preform, they found that the preform made by AFB is thinner, 1121-1156. It weighs less than the case of the hand layup. And also, but in this case, when you make the laminate, then the laminate become thicker. The reason for that is because during the 
laminate fabrication, they people apply pressure, and the pressure has more effect on the manually uh, manual uh, preform than the case of the uh, AFP. The fiber volume fraction in the case of AFP is larger, less void, and also you use less resin. So these are all advantages of the automatic fiber placement for dry preform, except except for the filling time. When you are filling the resin into the uh, the, the composite, then it takes longer more than two times the time required in order to fill. So next here, I talked about the use of uh, AFP uh, to make thermoplastic composite. So thermoplastic composite is uh, independent of the kind of resin because of the fact that you have high viscosity. And uh, so that means you need to really heat it up to high temperature in order to reduce, reduce viscosity. And uh, so the, depending on the kind of matrix that you have, whether you have the PEI, PBS, or you have big, then the, the process temperature can vary between 275 to 400 degrees centigrade. So thermoplastic composites certainly have more issues than the case of thermoset. Usually the objective in manufacturing of thermoplastic composites using AFVR structure have minimum amount of white, have a good degree of crystallinity for the resin, no deconsolidation, no distortion, good rate of production and good surface finish. And again, I mentioned there are many issues. The issue, the first one here is that we have, uh, I'm sorry, let's see the heating, the heat sources. Now the, the heat source for the case of thermoplastic composite have to be stronger than the case of thermoset. That's because you have to melt the, uh, the resin uh, because of the high viscosity. So uh, we, there are five different kinds of heat source for thermoplastic composite. First, hot guy stock. So that has been around for some time. The U nitrogen is a way to heat. Direct open flame stock. Third is laser, which is, I think, more people use these laser these days. And recently, recently, over the last few years, they have the heat lamp. And infrared has been around, but it's not as strong compared to the other four different kinds of heat source. So in more detail, we have the uh, direct hot guy stock or direct flame. So here we have nitrogen guys is used, is heated by electric heater located before the tip of the nozzle. And the nitrogen guy, the nitrogen flow can be adjusted. However, the disadvantage of this is that hot gas stream cannot be pointed in multiple directions efficiently. And also there is a heat loss to the environment. The red flame is similar to the, the hot gas stock, except they use uh, propane uh, gas and, and oxygen. And also uh, the ratio can be adjusted, but it has similar kind of disadvantage like the hot gas stock is that the flame cannot be pointed in multiple directions efficiently. And there's a heat loss to the environment. Laser, uh, quite a few machines these days use laser. The, the power of the laser can vary anywhere between three kilowatt to five kilowatt diode laser. The wavelength is about a thousand nanometer. The speed can be far from eight meter, eight meter, meter per minute to 12 meter per minute. And one of the advantage of the laser is that they can use a soft roller. That is a case of made of silicone. And the fact that you use a soft roller like a silicone, it allow more larger area of contact between the layer of the composite. And that way you probably tend to have a good interlaminar shear strength. However, the disadvantage of the laser is safety consideration because of the fact that the heat is strong and you need to make sure that it doesn't hit the operator during the process. And over the last few years, they come the heat lamp, the HUM3. Uh, it uses a high energy flashes via xenon lamp which heat the material through radiation. The uh, three parameter voltage frequency and pulse duration. So the advantage of the heat lamp is that it can direct the heat in different location, 25% to what the, uh, the incoming tape, 25% to the nip point and 50% directed at the substrate. The disadvantage is that it's fairly new. So that we need to uh, kind of study and learn more about it. Now, one of the advantage, the, the kind of issue with the thermoplastic composite is interlaminate shear strength. What I find is that the Interlaminar shear strength of laminate made by thermoplastic composite is not as high compared to the cut of the other clay. So in the publication in 2019, there was a comparison between the interlaminar shear strength of laminate made by different kind of uh, AFB using different kind of uh, uh, composite. And the value is about 50, something like about you know, around 50 MPA. And that is compared to about 80 MPA. So that's roughly about 60% that of the other clay. Now, there are many reasons why the interlaminar shear strength of um, the uh, thermoplastic composite made by AFP is not as high compared to autoclave. So what I find that there are basically two reasons. One is the bond formation. 
And the second is the consolidation after the midpoint. Number one formation is the same that when you take a look into the process of the AFV, for example, you have the incoming tap, the incoming tap here, and you have the substrate, the one that is deposited beforehand. And these two here have to come together and they have to bond together. Now during this process here, you can break it down into many steps. The first step is that the surface asperities have to be flattened. So that means between these two surfaces, there may be some kind of a roughness and these roughness have to be flattened. Okay, because they get melted and flattened. Then the two surfaces have to get into intimate contact. They touch each other. Then the intimate contact has to be long enough. So that way then the molecules of the thermoplastic need can diffuse, can wrap that across the interface to make the bond. Now also there is some kind of dynamic shear effect that may help to reduce the viscosity to do that as well. Now there was some estimate in terms of the time required for the bond, the reputation to take place across. And this gives an equation as a function of the viscosity. The Etna has a viscosity in MPA. Now if the, the viscosity obtained is around one kilopascal second, that the time required for the contact here has about, it has to be about 22.9 microsecond for it to happen. Now on the other side of the picture, you take a look into the parameter of the process. So the time that this is in contact is equal to the length, the contact length here divided by the velocity of motion. So this is by by this equation, T equal to E, E is the length of the contact divided by V, which is the velocity of motion. If we take the speed of the position is four inch per second, and E equal to uh, say the 25, uh, zero, one quarter inch for the case of a soft roller, that the time is 62 and a half microseconds. If the length here is only one eighth of an inch, that the time is only 31.3 microseconds, which is kind of just barely enough to do this. Except that this time here is only for the case of the reptation. It doesn't take into account the time required for flattening the surface abilities and also for intimate contact. So that means in this case here that the time of contact is just barely enough or just on the borderline to, to be able to make a good one. Now the second reason for this is we could talk about deconsolidation after the nip point. Here you have the roller that is pressing the layer down. Now after what the roller moves forward and you have the region behind, behind the, the nip point, that is the region between B and C. Now it depends what the temperature of the piece in this region. If the temperature here is more than the class transition temperature of the resin, then what happens due to the springiness of the fibers that you it tend to deconsolidate. And when it deconsolidates, certainly it affects the interlaminar shear strength. Now another issue with the case of thermoplastic metric composite is the distortion of structures with the free edge. Now I did, we identified two kinds of structure. One is structure without free edge, such as the case of a cylinder like this. For the cylinder without free edge is no problem. We were able to make them very well, no, no, no issues. However, for the structure with the free edge, that means that you have something like a flat plate or the case where you have a curved panel where, where the fiber is cut. Then what we find is that right after the process, you have the distortion. Even for the case of a unidirectional layer, when you make a unidirectional layer, okay? Now the reason for this is because of the thermal gradient, because of the fact that the temperature varies throughout the space uh, in X, Y, Z direction, in all directions. And this developed during the process. So that means right after you make, you will also have this kind of situation. Now one example of thermal gradient is that we take a look into, we find that also the lamina tend to, tend to bend. This one here shows a section of uh, the thermoplastic composite along the width. So the distance from left to right here is about one quarter of an inch, so the so width. What we find here is that during the process, the width become longer. The width become longer and the thickness become thinner, which is expected. But what is what else that is observed is that we find that also this tend to bend, tend to bend like this. So this is schematic representation of the width of the laminate. So you take a look into the midpoint A on the left and the midpoint B on the right, you connect them with a the line. So these, if there's no bending, then the point C and D should be the same. But if there is a gap here, there is bending. So the picture below show you this one laminate. You can see that the line BC is here, AB is here. That's the yellow line here. And also this is along the line CD and there is a gap. The same thing for the laminate below. You have the line AB here and you have the line CD here. 
and it shows that you have a gap. So this one here, this reason for this bending is because of the thermal gradient that is developed. So now we, will, we want to show you some of the work we have done on thermoplastic composite at Concordia University. So over the past few years, we have been working with two major companies in Montreal, Bell Flight, uh, and also Bombardier uh, Aerospace to, uh, for the Bell Flight. We work on the development of a thermoplastic uh, uh, composite uh, to use as a cross piece for the support of helicopter as a landing gear. And the other one here for Bombardier, we develop a nacelle lip for laminar flow for the engine. So for the case of the, uh, the piece, uh, the cross piece for the landing gear, now right now it's made of aluminum and uh, the, the people that want to replace aluminum, uh, there are many reasons for this, okay. Now the requirement for this is that it had to be stiff and strong, but also the, cha the challenge is how to absorb a large amount of energy on failure. Now we know composite are stiff and strong, that's fine, but the composite usually tend to help, tend to be brutal. So how do you make sure that it can uh, exhibit a large amount of energy before failure? So here we use thermoplastic composite because it tends to be better than thermoset in terms of the kind of energy absorption. Well, also we have a design spatial layup in such a way that you can really have a large amount of energy absorption. So here, this one here shows you just a video about the way how we program the machine to be able to, uh, to get the layup along the different kind of orientation to, uh, to do it. And then this case here, then uh, we have made a straight tube. We have also made curved tube. And also we have a setup that can do, uh, can do the bending, you know, can have the uh, two point bending or three point bending, either on a straight tube or on a curved tube. Now the work on the uh, Nassau lip for the laminar flow for um, Bombardier and Dima. So apart from the fact that we need to be able to machine to, to really kind of manufacture to the shape, but also the other aspect, they had to have good surface finish. Now, the reason for this is because of the fact that this is had to allow air flow and they want to have minimum resistance to air when it flows through, so it had to have a good surface finish. So in this case here, that means we have made the pieces here and you can see that the way we address the kind of finish is by using a technical repass. Repass, I mean that when you, when you finish it, then you only lay, you can run the, the, the machine over the surface without any deposition. And the other aspect you have to address is distortion. And where do you a kneeling technique to address distortion? In terms of repass, repass means passing the torque and roller without putting the deposition. So I show you the measure of roughness RA. If you make the thing without repass, the roughness is about 40 micron. One repass is reduced down to five and so on. Compared to other glaive is about one. Now along the fiber direction, the roughness before repass is 20. After re one repass is four, two repass, three, and other level. And also this one here shows you the microstructure. What we found is that the uh, repass can also help to reduce the void content as well. So future outlook um, is the sense that uh, what we go from here, you know, there are people that have certain opinion. One is that they feel about collaborative fiber placement, that when you use more than one robot to make a piece, okay? Now, there was a publication from Composite World in 2019. They mentioned about the system control fee from the German Aerospace Center. And in this case here, then they were, they were depositing material onto a vertical mantle. So in this case, the robot is placing material on the, on the vertical mantle. And you can use more than one robot to do that. And normally they have the cell, the cell for eight robots. And each, they are four and four. So four robots uh, are working on it that are four robots in reserve. And that way they can also, they have some kind of a track here to be able to move them in and out. So the kind of critical issue here is programming. They have to make sure the program is good so that they avoid collision between the robot and also to make sure that each one of them does a portion of the job. Now also the other thing that we feel about the future is that limitation application of ATL and AFB. Now, certainly ATL and AFB are very good in making uh, large components. However, they are small parts, such so as rips, power brackets. They may not be efficiently used ATL and AFB. And also has a complex feature, such so as double curvature, tight corner, and steel ramps are challenging. And also the couple dots are very high. These machines cost than a million of dollars and many small and medium companies may not be able to enter into the technology. So we feel that all, right now, they, they may be Something that may expand the use of automotive composite manufacturing is either making additive manufacturing or smaller AFP. So these are the other ends of the picture. 
the case of 3D printing with continuous fibers, you have the people feed in the resin together with the fiber. And that way right now, the Mark Force company has two models, Mark II and X7. They can handle carbon fiber, natural fiber, and glass fiber. So right now we have the two spectrum. You have the large machines to be able to do handle aircraft manufacturing. And you have the small piece made by either 3D or 4D printing. And hopefully in the future, maybe we can use these two technology to make some kind of commercial products. And in terms of the small AFV machine, small AFV machine in 2018, there's a company in Finland called Espo. They develop a small AFV machine. The weight is 16 and a half kilogram. It can sit on top of a desk, uh, a, a, a desk. It can handle carbon natural and glass fiber and it can do uh, uh, different kind of toes, uh, one quarter, one half of one inch. So conclusion, my conclusion is that the um, for thermostat metric composite, they have been successfully used in making aircraft structures. Improvement can be made on speed, uh, or deposition, automated inspection, reduce or reduction in medium radius for fiber steering, and understanding of the performance structure containing defects that they lap and gaps. For thermoplastic composite, we need to have improvement for the heating sources, and we need to address low internal mana shear strength distortion with structure with three edges. And future outlook, in terms of trying to go to commercial products here will be smaller AFV machines or 3D printer with continuous fibers. I would like to acknowledge the financial support from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, Bell Flight, Bombardier and Dima, and also many of my uh, associate and uh, student and colleague, Daniel Roska, Xiao Kai, Fajat Chatmeri, Hang Wang, Juan Mundit, Jeffrey Simpson, Ashraf Fathi, and many students. I thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> Oh, okay, so if we get to we get some questions, I see there are some questions being um, posted. So the first is, what is the main barrier to the adoption of AFP thermoplastics? I mentioned there are a few uh, issues, uh, such as a high temperature, the uh, low uh, internal mass shear strength, and the distortion. But I think that the uh, the first two issues can be resolved. The third one. We are working on that right now, so it seems to be more difficult in the sense of the distortion of the structure, uh, particularly for those with the free edge. Uh, you know, if you make some structure, such as the uh, cylinder or surface of revolution, then uh, no problem. Thermoplastic is doing extremely well. But you have structure that have uh, free edges, a cut edge such as a flat plate or curved panel, then the distortion is an issue. So we have to really work at it. We are thinking about using some kind of annealing as a way how to address that. But I think people also have made the uh, thermoplastic on a hot mandrel. I mean, you can heat up the mandrel, then you can avoid the issue, except that it can be quite involved. Yeah. Am I right in thinking that all the, all the work that you've described at Concordia is based on in situ consolidation of um, thermoplastic AFB? Yes, that's right. I mean, only just using the uh, AFB without all the other autoclaves. Without, it, without a, a, subsequent, uh, a, a subsequent processing, okay. So the, the, the next question we have here is from Sciaticos. It says, with higher, more focused heating from lasers, how will you present, prevent heating up of the rollers when you're running in production 24 seven? Well, I think that the, um, I have not seen any kind of publication information about the life of the roller. Okay, people so far have made only um, probably some kind of sample or whatever that they study maybe during um, kind of research study. Um, so I have, I don't have an answer for you to, in terms of how long it lasts in terms of- uh, I, in terms of experience, I have seen black smoke coming off a silicone rubber roller when a five kilowatt uh, laser is in. Yeah, so, so that can be an issue, you know, that it may, you have to re replace that fairly often. <laughs> okay, so we have a, a question here from Stephen Beecher. It says, does the repass need to follow the direction of the fiber placement, or could a separate larger witch roller for the purpose of the repass be used? For the repass, we have run the repass in both directions, along the fiber direction and transfers to the fiber direction. Like the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the RA, the, the, the result that we have obtained, I have shown that you in the slide. I mean, we have done both. So that means that 
you can have a large roller that can help as well. In the sense that um, you know you can cover a large area and that can help to to reduce the time that you have to do that. Okay, I have a couple of questions here from from Matthew Watt. Uh, the first is how suitable is AFP for a quasi-isotropic layer, or is it mainly suitable for load pass optimized UD structures? We have made uh, sample using a quasi-isotropic layer. That means the 09045. We have made that. Okay. So um, so it can be done, except that you have the issue of the distortion. Yeah. So uh, what happened, we have, we have made that on a hot mantle. You hit the mantle above the TG of the thermoplastic, then it's okay. So we were able to do that. For You don't have just only the uni structure. Okay, he also asks whether it would be possible to lay up onto a soluble former. Well, I think it depends on the, uh, how, you need to have a hard surface. You have your, the surface had to be solid because during the layup of the of the AFB, you have to press down. There is a certain load that you have to push. So if the solo farmer can withstand that kind of a load, then you can do it. But if not, then it may break or you have some some problem. So it depends on the, the quality, the solidness of your your farmer. Okay. So what, certainly the 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 data that you put out showed on electro impact was very interesting. Uh, it's very similar to data I've seen from other suppliers and from and from production sites in terms of uh, the amount of downtime that one can see. Do you have any insight into how the reliability of the the machinery or that the it should really be thought of like as, as a manufacturing system um, rather than the machine? But do you have any ideas on how you might improve that reliability? Uh, actually, uh, I don't have the first-hand knowledge of uh, of, the, of the system. I mean, what basically I obtained from the literature. So, okay. so it's the same that um, I mean that's what they present. I, I I don't think I have an answer for you. I mean, how reliable that is? Uh, they they seem to uh, to claim that they can do a good job. So, I mean, that's I, I don't have an answer for you. That's it. No. I think one of one of the other things that that, that interests me about these things is is um, the training side of it. I mean, do you have any thoughts in the best way to train um, people in design for automated processing? Well, I mean, in, for our operation, uh, it took a while for somebody to, to pick up on the learning curve. So, um, so in that sense here that, um, you know, you need to have uh, Certainly the training, how to use it, how to run the machine is one thing, but also you need to be able to understand the behavior of the uh, material and also the, um, the mechanical aspect of that as well. So there is, um, if you want to have some really, really good person that it may take a while to be able to understand the operation, but then you have to get the programming in terms of the path of the, uh, the fiber path, that's one thing, that you need to be able to run the machine. Then if you, uh, you have to understand how the, Performance. I mean, you know, from the uh, from the structure point of view, the stress analysis, the uh, so so that means that you know, from my experience, it took about a year to get somebody to kind of be familiar right. with the operation. Okay. The, the other thing that was interesting, your your, your comments on um, steering radius for um, uh, you 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 were implying, I think, that the steering was primarily to um, follow the load path. Whereas most steering is done to cover doubly curved surfaces. Yes, uh, steering can be used for many applications. It doesn't have to, uh, you know, normally from the mechanical engine point of view, then you say, okay, you follow the load path, so you can have the maximum thing there. But there may be other aspects that you can also use steering too. So in the sense here, I put the statement there just to for us academic to be aware of what the industry are thinking. But I think the steering uh, world study uh, has uh, applications, you know, has a lot of application in terms of uh, optimization of the uh, buckling, the stiffness performance, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, um, just as, a, as an update, the, the toe shearing that you um, talked about, the minimum steering radius for that is under 50 millimeters. Yes, I, I, I read orders, that, orders of magnitude lower. Yes, yeah, that's right. I, I read your work in terms of the total theory, so that seemed to be very interesting. Yes, yes. And then a couple more questions have just have just come in. Um, well, first, ask what kind of resin is suitable for infusion in automated dry fiber placement. Well, we, we have a project right now. Uh, we made the uh, dry fiber as a preform, and then we use epoxy. 
like a resin, a, a, you know, the similar resin like the case of RTM or something like that. You know, the, 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 basically, the dry fiber is like the preform. Okay, similar to the case of the liquid composite molding, except here it helps you to make the preform. And then you can use the resin that you use for RTM to infuse into that, uh, into, into the preform. Okay, I think we have just time for one last question. Um, and we have this from uh, an anonymous attendee. It says, in future development, you cited additive layer manufacturing as possible complementary technology to AFP in thermoplastic composites. What about additive manufacturing exploitation even for thermosetting composites in conjunction with AFP? Well, actually, I thought about I thought about using thermoset composite uh, using additive manufacturing. See, most of the additive manufacturing right now they use thermoplastics, and uh, not a lot of thermoset. Okay, so I thought about it and to say, you know, maybe we can do that, but certainly there are issues in terms of using thermoset because of the fact that you have to clean the uh, the inside of your your machine. Yep. Uh, thermoset will uh, kind of gum up, and you know, you may destroy your machine in no time. So, uh, so from that point of view, then. Uh, then you know it's not there yet. It's not there yet. I've there a few publications on the topic, but I don't think it's really is really there. So there's uh, that new ground for development. Okay. Okay. So anyway, I think we 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 we've run out of time. So thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So I think um, that's all we have for today.